Now today's lecture um, is on the earthquake. Next week at exactly the same time and place, we will have a lecture uh, by Malcolm Bowman, Professor Bowman, uh, on, uh, on tsunami and on um, uh, surges in general. And then two weeks from today, which is the 6th of April, uh, we hope to have uh, Bill Horak from DNL, who uh, will talk to us about uh, nuclear reactors. So I won't keep you, I just want to very briefly introduce Dan Davis. Dan Davis has been a, a member of the Stony Brook faculty in the Department of Geosciences for a number of years. I know him personally because he served uh, an incredibly successful term as the head of the Honors College here at Stony Brook a few years ago. And I'm, I'm really delighted uh, that Dan is able to talk to us today. So, Dan, it's all Thank yours. You. Over the past couple of weeks, the whole world has watched with sympathy and concern as Japan has struggled to cope with a linked set of crises, originating in the magnitude 9 earthquake on March 11th, offshore of northern Honshu. The problems facing Japan today are a combination of the effects of that earthquake, followed by the resultant tsunami, followed by the nuclear crisis created by both the shaking and the flooding. This, as Mark Aronoff just said, is the first in a series of three provostial lectures about that triad of misery. Next week, Dr. Malcolm Bowman of SOMES will speak about this tsunami and the tsunami risk to the eastern United States. In two weeks, Dr. William Horak of BNL will talk about nuclear power and the problems at uh, Fukushima Daiichi. We've all seen horrifying pictures of scenes like this in Miyagi Prefecture, as in this case as the tsunami approached Sendai Airport. I want to uh, show you a brief, a brief video you may or may not have seen to give you a sense of the magnitude of this event. Just astonishing in scale. It seems like a bit of an odd combination, but fire is commonly associated with earthquakes as well and also with tsunamis. Uh, here, in this case, uh, in the town of uh, Naturi. Now, shaking often breaks down, breaks up gas lines, and that can, in modern times, start fires. Uh, back in the days of kerosene lamps, the fires were often caused by uh, the shaking overturning the lanterns. In fact, in, uh, back in 1906, during the great San Francisco earthquake, uh, so much, a huge fraction of the damage was from the fire. Much of San Francisco burned and for a number of years afterwards, city officials always made sure to refer to the disaster as the fire because any city could have a fire. Chicago had a fire, London had a fire, great cities have fires, but any kind of a talk of earthquakes uh, they figured might frighten away immigrants and investors. 
here in the town of Kisenema, we see the unimaginable destruction that happens when a powerful earthquake is followed by a tsunami that can move ships as well as the debris from the intense seismic shaking that preceded it by a matter of minutes. Similar destruction is found along a wide, sweat, wide, stretch, wide stretch of the Pacific coast of northern Honshu. So if we're going to understand what happened, we need to go back to geological basics. In the past half century, we've come to understand that the outer shell of the earth is divided into a small number of deforming but relatively rigid plates. Now we are here at a good distance away from any plate boundary. So our area has relatively little seismic activity. But there are various types of plate boundaries and different things happen at each type. We're all familiar with the San Andreas Fault. That's a place where two great plates are sliding horizontally past each other at a rate of uh, several centimeters per year. In fact, if this motion were to continue at the same rate, sometime about 50 million years from now, Los Angeles would become the largest city in Alaska. The mind boggles at that one. There are other places where plates spread apart. The nearest example for us of that phenomenon is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where new crust is being created at a rate of about two centimeters per year. So every year, we're getting almost an inch further away from Europe as the Atlantic Ocean expands. Well, since the Atlantic Ocean is expanding, then there has to be contraction somewhere else. Now, if that happens in a place where you have two bits of the buoyant continental crust, you get great mountain ranges like the Himalayas. A previous collision with Africa is what created the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern US. But where you have some of the denser type of crust, what we call oceanic crust, coming in with the less dense type of crust associated with continents, then that denser crust is shoved down into the mantle. It sinks down in a process we call subduction. That is, what ha is what's happening today in Japan, where the crust of the Pacific and Philippine sea plates is subducting at about eight centimeters per year beneath Japan. It's also what's happening around much of the Pacific. All of these places are gonna figure in what I I'm telling you about today because all of these are places where this great process of subduction produces the biggest kind of earthquake the earth can make. Now let's look a little bit closer at Japan and we see that Japan is in an extraordinary spot. The merging of four different major plates, pretty much unique in the world. All of these little triangular teeth they correspond to places where plates are converging with each other. So here, the Philippine Sea Plate is subducting at several centimeters per year beneath the Eurasian Plate. Here, the Pacific Plate is subducting beneath the Philippine Sea Plate, and so on. Now let's take a look at what this process actually looks like a little closer up. The crust beneath the Pacific Ocean sinks at a shallow angle below beneath Japan, moving a bit over eight centimeters a year, as I said. This subduction leads to deep-seated volcanism, and that volcanism is what's helped to build up the, island, the islands of Japan over the past several million years. But this cartoon made the process look like a steady state, a rather nonviolent flowing process. It's nothing like that at all. This cartoon here shows us a different story. It shows how part of the fault between the two plates can get locked. And for many years, it can't slip. It deforms the upper plate until there's an earthquake when the stresses are released. If that plate produces large vertical motions, we then have a tsunami. 
So it's the vertical motions from one of these great plate boundary earthquakes at the bottom of the seafloor that displaces the water that produces the tsunami. Now, the energy released by the great Hanshin Kobe earthquake in 1995 was about a thousand times smaller than in this earthquake. But anybody who was old enough to remember anything who lived in Japan at that time remembers that event very strongly. Because it was at a shallow depth and below urban areas, it produced a huge amount of damage, however. Scenes like this were found throughout Kobe and nearby cities. In the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, one that Americans tend to know as the World Series earthquake because it delayed the, the first game of the World Series, uh, the most spectacular failure was in an elevated motorway, elevated expressway. The same was true in Kobe. After that earthquake, however, engineering standards in Japan were raised to the point where now they are the best in the world. Now, what about this earthquake? It was offshore, further away, but very big. Well, there are lots of scenes of damage, in this case, to roads and bridges, and more to buildings of various sorts. This collapsed railway bridge in uh, Fukushima is typical of the recurring problems after great earthquakes and tsunamis. Even in a technologically advanced country like Japan, the destruction of transportation can make it difficult to rush help to where it's most needed. The entire three-part tragedy in Japan is the result of the earthquake. But because of the severity of the tsunami and the nuclear issues, most of the public focus has not been on the direct shaking damage, but it was real. This refinery and the fire there demonstrates that even far from the epicenter, this is about 350 kilometers south of the epicenter near Tokyo Bay, the infrastructure of modern life can be very vulnerable to strong seismic shaking. If it weren't for Japan's exceptionally good seismic engineering codes, we would have seen a lot more images like this, a uh, partial collapse of a building ground floor. The large-scale slumping of hillsides, like this one in Tsukagawa, is to be expected in a great earthquake. Nothing you can do about that. And this scene is a good example of the double impact of intense shaking followed by tsunami. Next, I want to show you a very brief but amazing video. Uh, I've drawn in here a few things for you to look at. Note the gap between these buildings. Note these lines and the outline of this, of this building here. And most of all, note the reflection in these windows of clouds that are lit by the sun. You can clearly see the swaying of the buildings and the motion of the cloud reflection gives you a sense of how much these buildings are swaying. The fact that the buildings are swaying but not seriously damaged is a tribute to excellent engineering as well as distance from the fault slip. Tokyo is about 370 kilometers from the epicenter. And fortunately, cities nearer the quake, for the most part, don't have very tall buildings. Now, there are various ways of describing shaking. And they have all sorts of technical terms, and they're related to uh, the fraction of uh, uh, gravity of acceleration that's experienced, or total ground motion. But there are qualitative ways of describing it. And these levels, in something called the modified Mercalli intensity scale, can be described as violent, severe, and very strong. And what I've done here, 
I've listed in each, for each of these intensity levels, I've listed the two biggest cities that experienced it and the total population of the half dozen or so largest municipalities. Almost a quarter of a million, over two million, almost 12 million. So even down in Yokohama and Tokyo, it was substantial shaking. Now, what, we're gonna, this, what we see here is the distribution of shaking intensity in terms of a scale used in Japan. And you'll notice that indeed it's very strongly concentrated on the east coast in mid-northern Honshu. It's elongated because of the position of the fault slip area that I'll show you in a minute. But if you look at what some of these mean, in this area it was at a level where objects are literally thrown by the shaking Inc and objects including people. All of the red areas you can't stand. The only way to move is by crawling. Very, very intense shaking. A little more quantitatively, this is what's called a strong, mo strong motion sensor record in Tokyo. And uh, it registered sizable motions for a period of six minutes. Now, part of that is because of the size of the shaking, but part of it is also the size of the fault area that slipped. If you think of dropping a pebble in a pond and you're a little bug sitting on a lily pad, what, that ripple will come to you and you'll feel it as almost like a shock. That's what people would report if they are near, say, a magnitude 4 earthquake like the one offshore Long Island last fall. A really big earthquake doesn't involve slip in one point on a fault. That slip may start in one point, but in the following seconds and minutes, other areas extending up to a couple of hundred kilometers away also start slipping. So now I want you to envision one pebble dropping, then around that a half dozen more, around that 20 more, around that 100 more, around that 1,000 more. Your little lily pad is going to keep on shaking a very long time, not just from the number of ripples, but from the fact that some of them are coming from much further away and some of them started much later. Ground acceleration in Tokyo. This is astonishing. Down in Tokyo, almost for a short period of time, almost one-sixth of a G. So if you weigh 100 pounds during the period of several seconds, you would feel a weight going from 116 to 84 to 116 to 84 because of the ground. That same motion you get in an elevator as elevator accelerates you upward or downward. And really unbelievably, a strong motion sensor up in Miyagi Prefecture gave for a very brief time, a couple of seconds, 2.7 G of acceleration. That means that you are accelerated up enough so that your 100 pounds becomes 370, but then the ground falls away from you faster than you fall. In other words, you're thrown in the air. This is a localized effect, not, nothing like all of the prefecture got this. It's partly a result of ground conditions and so on, but it gives you a sense of the magnitude of what was suffered. Now this is, I'm going to take this picture of the Earth from out in space. And I want you to think about what would happen if we had x-ray vision and we could look in the Earth. So we see that the Earth has got iron-rich core. The inner part is solid, the outer part is liquid, and then silicate rock, mantle, and then this little scum that we live on, the crust on top. Once seismic waves get generated, they move through the body of the Earth and along the surface of the Earth. And the ones that move through the body wind up bouncing off, reflecting off these various boundaries. So this is what the waves coming from this earthquake looked like. These in red and blue here are two different types of body waves called P and S waves moving through the body of the earth and reflecting off various places. And notice as each of these waves reaches Stony Brook. Meanwhile, moving much more slowly along the surface of the Earth are these surface waves, which can be much larger, but take much longer to get to you. 
Well, you saw all these various waves coming through Stony Brook. Well, we have seismometer here at the Department of Geosciences. And like all good seismic setups, it's not just one seismometer, but it's three. One to measure vertical motions, because the Earth can shake vertically. And on that one, we can trace out various of these waves as they arrive. This is a beautiful, beautiful waveform. It's textbook classic. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of thing that uh, is relatively easy uh, to use to pick out waveforms. But you don't only get vertical vibrations, you get north-south and east-west vibrations. And on each one of them, you see a different set of these waves. By studying these waves from many stations around the world, you can learn not only about the particular earthquake that you're studying, precisely what happened, but also do a kind of tomography, an imaging of the interior of the Earth. One of the world leaders at doing that sort of thing, looking at the deep inner structure, is uh, Professor Lan Cheng Wen in the Geoscience Department, who's uh, studied very much in great detail the structure of the core and the, the core mantle boundary. Now, heading back to Japan and these plate boundaries, I want to give you a sense of what the earthquakes that happened, how they were distributed. There's a very nice program by uh, Alan Jones at uh, Binghamton University. And I want you to see, I'm going to play you the record of just two days worth of earthquakes. This doesn't include the biggest foreshock, and it's only the first two days from the big event and following two days. The colors indicate the depth. Because this great fault, this great plate boundary fault here, is at the seafloor right here and it gets deeper that way, the color will change across to deeper events towards the shore and shallower here. And the size of the circles tells you the size of the event. I remind you that that's two days worth. This has gone on for the past two weeks almost. Now what, does these mean? what do these mean? Well, if we take a look at it, the vast bulk of them fall in this oval area. These are the aftershocks of the main event on the fault that produced the main event. And in fact, we often use aftershock distributions to tell us what slipped in the big event. And this is a huge region extending more than 150, about 150 kilometers this way and a little more than 300 that way. There's some other events out here actually in the Pacific Plate. And these appear to be events in which the release of stress allowed the Pacific Plate to stop being into, in compression and actually to have some earthquakes in extension. Some other events were triggered on the other side of Japan at the convergent boundary between Japan and the Eurasian plate. Now, what about the sizes of these things? Well, the vertical axis here is the magnitude and this is the, the date from the 9th to the 19th of this month. There was a big magnitude 7.2 event which everyone thought was the big event. Making these, it's aftershocks. It turns out that it was merely a very, very large foreshock to the magnitude 9 event with a huge aftershock sequence following it. I've plotted the circles only down to magnitude 5. There are 36, I checked last night, between the big event and last night there were 36 aftershocks, magnitude six or bigger. Bigger than magnitude four, the four, and, a half or four and a half or larger, 656 aftershocks. Put these in perspective, this is the Southampton earthquake that made such a big fuss here. 
Uh, and you can see why people in the Department of Geosciences were less than overwhelmed by the event. This is the largest ever recorded in New York State, upstate. This is the highly damaging Christchurch, New, Jer uh, uh, New Zealand event uh, in January. It was very damaging because it was directly you, under land, very close to the city. The Kobe, 1995, and the Haiti event of last year, and then the San Francisco event, and Kanto, 1923, the great Tokyo earthquake of 1923, and the 2008 Sichuan earthquake, both up here. But all of them are dwarfed by this event, and the biggest look like the biggest of the aftershocks from this event. To give you some perspective on the human toll of these, the Kanto event killed about 143,000 people in the Sichuan, about 67,000. The Haiti event, over 222,000. The 1995 Kobe earthquake was a horrible human disaster, but it killed a little over 6,000 people. Much, much less than these other earthquakes. Despite the fact that it was terribly located under an urban area and shallow, that was largely because of engineering standards. Now, remember from before that an earthquake happens because part of a fault gets stuck and doesn't slide to accommodate the plate motion. Eventually, the stresses build and it becomes unstuck violently. In the process, though, the overlying plate is shortened. So as the downgoing plate goes down, but it's stuck here, it drags the front of the overlying plate down with it. This produces some geodetic signatures that are very important to understand. Putting them into a global model is, is a very important thing to do, and one of the world leaders in that is Professor Bill Holt in the geoscience department. Eventually, when it becomes unlocked, unstuck, that's when you get the sudden movement, sudden advance, uplift at the front, which produces a tsunami, and down drop behind. Well, when you look at the early results, early data from this earthquake, it appears that that's exactly what happened. You had a drop of as much as two meters behind, more than one meter along part of the shoreline an uplift of as much as four meters or more under the seafloor. Well, clearly, if you had a uh, rubber or plastic bottom bathtub and you punched it upward a lot, you would produce sizable waves even in your bathtub. Well, do that to the seafloor by four meters, and you can get a sense of why the tsunami was so big. On top of that, it turns out that it's possible to work out how much the fault slipped in total. It's a kind of a complicated figure to work out, but what this is saying is in this area, this color code tells you how much the fault slipped. And the key thing to take away from this is there's a large area, tens of kilometers across, where the fault slip was 25 to 30 meters of slip. So can you imagine an area many, many kilometers across, in fact, in total, 300 by 150, that moved on average very suddenly by several meters, where an area of maybe 10 by 30 kilometers of that moved by 25 meters on average. It's a huge event. To put it in the historic perspective, it is right up there as one of the four or five biggest ever recorded since we've had uh, seismometers. It's a rare event. When we say roughly every 20 years, that doesn't mean there won't be another tomorrow. And it doesn't mean it won't be 50 years before there's another. It just means that on average, we think roughly five per century, on average. The other thing to note is that energy increases enormously with size of earthquake. So a magnitude nine contains more than 30 times the energy of a magnitude eight. 
and a thousand times the energy of a magnitude 7, a million times the energy of a magnitude 5. So this leads to an incredible conclusion. Over the time when we've had reliable seismometers, only four earthquakes appear to have been responsible for about half of all the seismic energy released in the Earth, the entire planet. This month's earthquake contributed about 4% of the Earth's seismic budget since the year 1900. Now, there's some things that worked very well, as well as could be expected. One is a seismic warning system. There's amazing, you get a chance, look on YouTube, a uh, very, very boring parliamentary session is going on, and warnings are coming in before the seismic waves reach Tokyo, and then you start seeing the shaking. And this is true, a number of people have videos of their TV screen putting out warnings, and then the shaking beginning. Well, if you were right near the coast, the warning time was only 10 to 20 seconds. Not a lot, but there are stories of people in this area who hearing sirens go off and knowing what it meant, at least managed to run, hide beneath a desk or get away from a brick wall that might fall on them. The data isn't complete, but there's a general idea of what the tsunami heights look like and they're concentrated in this northeastern part of Japan. Not surprisingly because that's near the earthquake, but also because the geography of that area is very susceptible to tsunamis in a way we'll probably hear about next week because there's very high topography, so a lot of water runoff and you have a lot of valleys that are facing out in a V into the sea that are perfect for harbor waves, tsunamis. And the devastation in these settings is just astonishing. These towns all have that in common. They're in this kind of a setting where the, the waves have been able to be focused and built up. Now, this is a picture from 1960 of a boat on top of a building. And you think, okay, tsunamis happen in Japan. But the earthquake that caused this tsunami was in Chile. Remember I showed you the biggest earthquake of all time? One of those four, the biggest of those four that contributed half of the total energy in the last century plus. This was the biggest of them. This is the result of a tsunami in Japan from the Chile earthquake. This is one town after that. Again, it's in an area that's very susceptible to tsunamis. When you look at the uh, size of the tsunami from the 1960 earthquake, and uh, Brian Atwater of uh, University of Washington has done a wonderful job with this, you see that the highest tsunamis are concentrated in this part of Japan, largely because of the shape of the coastline. But unfortunately, that's also where this earthquake was. So there was this double effect of a tsunamogenic earthquake in a location that was very susceptible to tsunamis. Now there are some old records going back to uh, centuries in Japan from villages. And I've paraphrased this one with a little help. Uh, in, the Miyaki, in, sorry, in the Miyako district magistrate's office in uh, Kawagasaki village, past midnight, I translated times, on the night of what would be January 27, 1700, a tsunami arrived. Villagers escaped to the hills. After they left, a fire started that burned 20 houses. In addition, 13 houses were destroyed by the waves. It was reported that the flood and fire happened at the same time. Well, that should be familiar. We've seen pictures of that from this tsunami. What made this one odd is that people didn't know to run away because people in that part of the world, even if they haven't, they're too young to have experienced a tsunami, their parents and grandparents did, so they know. You feel an earthquake, you get ready to head up that hill. Well, there was no earthquake, they felt, because the earthquake was on the other side of the Earth, the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So they were surprised. They were very lucky to get away with this little damage. In another village, villagers escaped to the hills. Another, a first person report from the sort of leader of the village. I advise the villages old and young to escape to the shrine in the hills. That's in the village of Miho, 
And this actually is a contemporary, around the year 1700, painting of that village. So I thought it was quite elegant to find. If you look at the record of tsunamis, you find these sort of tan colors are the ones that correspond to earthquakes near Japan. But then there are these others in blue that didn't have an earthquake warning because they were from distant earthquakes. 1960 Chile, 1952 Kamchatka, and this one in, in the year 1700, which has been traced back to Cascadia, the coast of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia in Canada. Now, this little cartoon here, this would be Japan. Japan is an island arc. It's over a subduction zone. It's built up by the vol volcanism in that subduction zone. This might be Hawaii, a shield volcano in the middle of the plate. This would be one of those spreading centers like we have in the middle of the Atlantic and there are some in the Pacific as well. This would be the west coast of north, northern part of North America, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, another subduction zone. Here, a plate called the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting and there's geodetic evidence that there is locking on that plate boundary and there is a real risk that this will have another mega earthquake as it did in the year 1700. So that's one area of concern for North America, obviously the San Andreas. We're in pretty good shape here. But our part of the world is not completely devoid of earthquakes. These are earthquakes, 1990 to 2006. Now admittedly, the scale here from one to five is very different than showing in Japan. But it shows that we do get earthquakes. Here in the New York City area, a colleague and friend of mine, Lynn Sykes at uh, Lamont Geological Observatory, has mapped out earthquakes New York City and its, its area, the largest of which, 1884, just off Brooklyn, magnitude 5.5, very respectable. The Ramapo Fault System here. It's a relic from when the supercontinent was breaking up. Eventually, it split apart to our east, opening up the Atlantic Ocean. But when these were formed, Tunisia was about there. Tunisia and Morocco were right here. A whole series of faults formed trying to open up. This one didn't succeed. One out here did succeed. It became the progenitor of the Atlantic Ocean. But these faults are still there and you can actually see the location of that fault if you ever drive across the Tappan Zee Bridge. When you come along to the first rest stop at Slotesburg, you suddenly see a huge wall of rock. That is the opposite wall, the opposite side of that Ramapo Fault. Well, it's been pointed that the, this fault system goes right beneath um, Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. Fortunately, it's not an active plate boundary, so the risk is nothing like it would be at an active plate boundary, but non-zero in many people's opinion. So, as we'll hear next week from Malcolm Bowman, our tsunami risk in the New York, Long Island area, while not as immediate as around the Pacific, may be greater than most people would think. We also have non-zero seismic risk. But because of our fortunate location far from plate boundaries, we're far less at risk than Japan or the American West Coast. I hope that in this presentation, I've given you a little bit of a sense of the magnitude and the causes of this month's tragedy in Japan. Thank you.